Arizona. Okay, let's break down what we're seeing right now. Joining me once again is long crime legal analyst Terry Austin and retired LAPC, LAPD Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey. It's great to have you both here. Uh, Cheryl, let me first start with you. The accuracy of these cell phone, the cell phone data, I know it's a huge factor uh, in courtrooms. Again, what we saw yesterday from this witness was trying to show there was m so much communication between the different players here and tracking the location of Re Luis Rivera as well as Garcia, trying to say that they did travel from Miami to Tallahassee and were constant ca contact with Magbanawa. Uh, how reliable is this data? Well, I guess, you know, reliability is in the eye of the beholder, right? It's, it's what the jury believes. It's also confusing. Not only are the number of parties involved a little bit confusing, but so is this stuff with the cell phone towers. But listen, at the end of the day, the point of the matter is they're communicating a lot. And why? No, absolutely. And Terry, look, the defense has been trying to say, look, you're trying to match it up to the testimony of Luis Rivera. And a lot of it is consistent with the story that he told. But there are there could potentially be gaps and things that he said he was in one place, but it might not be matched up to the records uh, from the cell phone, the cell phone records. So how much is a jury going to hold on to that? I think the jury is listening to see if they can find any inconsistencies. Digital information is important because it places the defendants at the scene of the crime or on the way to the scene of the crime. But if the defendant's attorney can in any way put some doubt in the jury's mind that it was wrong or that there was traffic or that there was water or it was too far away or maybe the phone was with someone else, then they can plant that little bit of doubt to say maybe the digital evidence isn't all that they think it is. What is interesting to note is there is no communications between Luis Rivera and the Adelsons. There is one communication between Garcia and the Adelsons. That's when Garcia allegedly tried to call Harvey Adelson on July 1st, 2014. This is before uh, the murder was, uh, the killing was uh, ultimately committed. Uh, and there's no contact from what we're seeing between Charlie Adelson and Sigfredo Garcia. That's why it's so important to have Catherine Magbanawa as that link, linking the family to the defendant uh, Garcia here. All right, let's just jump out of this for a second. Cheryl, uh, where we are in this case, how do you think the prosecution's doing at establishing that, you know, they, it's not just Garcia, but they also have to go after Magbanawa, who wasn't in the car. She didn't travel to Tallahassee, but she was the one allegedly directing and communicating and overseeing this plot. How are they doing at targeting both of these defendants so far? I think I think they're doing a really good job. I think that, you know, understanding Magbanawa was not going to be actively involved in the murder and so there was no reason for her to be there, but because of the chatter going on amongst the three, I think it paints in my mind a pretty clear picture that um, whatever it was they were asked to do, they were in the process of doing it and there was a lot of communication about how well it was going. Yeah, especially when no one from the Adelson family has been charged or arrested. It, it, the prosecution is doing a very good job of telling the story. But don't count the defense out yet, Terry, right? I mean, we've seen them cross-examine each witness very thoroughly, asking pointed questions. Remember, both defendants are represented by separate counsel. There are differing interests here. Uh, how are they doing at trying to establish, maybe if you're Magbanawa's attorney, that she is just the victim of being around the wrong men and she had nothing to do with what happened. And if you're Garcia's attorney saying, hey, listen, point it at Luis Rivera. He's the person who went on the stand and admitted his wrongdoing. We can't trust anything that he has to say. So how are they doing at establishing doubt? I think they are doing a decent job. I mean, they are arguing exactly what you said, Jesse. One defendant, Garcia, is pointing at Rivera. And I think that Banwa is definitely saying, I wasn't around. I wasn't there. I'm using my phone as a normal person. How can you tie me into all of this? But I do think, to Cheryl's point, that the prosecution is doing a very nice job. In the opening, the prosecution said that McBama was the one who really tied them to the Adelsons. So I do think that the prosecution has established a connection here between, you know, Rivera Garcia and McBanwa and the Adelson. So they are making the point that this was a hit and that these three defendants were involved in killing Dan Marco. Okay, you can't talk about the defendants without talking about the Adelsons, which have come up during the course of this testimony as well. Now, Cheryl, I want to go to you. There, I understand that in certain cases there is a disconnect 
between uh, law enforcement and the prosecuting attorney, between the district attorney and the law enforcement about when to prosecute somebody, when to file charges, when to go forward with the prosecution. In this case, based upon everything that you've seen, are you surprised that charges haven't been brought against either Charlie Adelson or Donna Adelson? And, and again, they have denied all involvement in this. They have never been arrested or charged in connection with Dan Markell's murder. But from your point of view, from a law enforcement point of view, are you surprised that we haven't seen that? No, I'm not surprised. And listen, there's no statute of limitations on murder. And so, you know, I, I don't believe that there's a disconnect. I believe that they want to make sure, the prosecutor particularly wants to make sure that they have a strong case. And so, listen, let's not hurry. Let's make sure that we have everything in order. Our ducks are all lined up because they're only going to get one bite at the apple in terms of a conviction. And so there's no urgency about bringing them to task for this murder. Terry, as they are building their case against Magbanawa and Garcia, Luis Rivera has already pled guilty. If they secure convictions against these two, how will that play out in the next few months in terms of the Adelsons? We know that they've been watching this carefully. In fact, what we learned yesterday is that Charlie Adelson's ex-girlfriend actually testified that she said she spoke to him or she communicated with him the day before her testimony. So clearly there's a lot involved in what's happening in this trial. How will it play out for the Adelsons if these two people are ultimately convicted? It's going to really help with the case against Charlie Adelson. And, you know, quite frankly, Jesse, you just raised a very good point. What came out yesterday in terms of the conversation with Adelson before the witness went on the stand is crucial because all of that information is going to be used again at trial. And remember, this case took place in 2014. It's now 2019. It takes time when there are so many defendants and there's a hit person and connecting all of the dots. So I think what the prosecution is doing is trying to get as much information as possible. And to Cheryl's point, they only have one bite at this apple. They're going to ultimately go after the persons who Put this whole plot together. And I imagine that also if they're successful in this case, they might say, hey, look, we did some great things in this trial. It'll help us in a prosecution against someone in the Adelson family as well. Take some of the good parts because it is a complicated case. But like you said, one of the things we also heard yesterday, which was pretty incredible, was a phone conversation between Charlie Adelson and Erica Johnson, who worked at his dental office, uh, responding to FBI agents coming in and saying, we want the records of Catherine Magbanawa's we're working there, and he, you could argue, was telling her to not really cooperate with them, and maybe she shouldn't hand over the records. He then said, well, look, I can't tell you what to do. You can talk to everybody you want, but it's not my office. It's my father's office. So interesting thing right there. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll be live with more.